if we don't have that vision set, then that same opportunity can come along. We don't even notice it. It's like we're asleep and that opportunity just floats on by and we don't take advantage of it. And we kept on doing more of the same. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears and joining me today is Ryan Willard. Today we're going to be having a very special conversation and I want to remind you that this is the podcast where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architectural practice so you can do your best work more often. Now, if you haven't already, head it over to the Smart Practice Method webpage to get access to the free 60-minute firm owner masterclass. What are you waiting for? Head over to smartpracticemethod.com and you'll discover in 60 minutes or less a compiled presentation of over a decade plus of best practices about how you can structure your practice for success. Welcome, Ryan. Today we're here to talk about every architecture project isn't a fit. What do we mean by this? I think, I remember, I think I heard you say this, that saying no to projects can be quite difficult, but saying yes to the wrong projects is even more difficult. And, you know, with every yes, we're actually saying a thousand no's. And it's a little bit like, um, so my partner, she's an actor. She was, is an actress. And a few years ago, maybe a decade ago or so, she was auditioning for all sorts of wonderful, exciting films and for TV series and all sorts of stuff. And then she auditioned for a, I think it was a a Shakespeare show. She got the part, but it was on a cruise ship. Right, and it meant doing mm, like it fun. meant it meant doing three shows a day, but it was solid wow. income. It was a good pay. It was like you know, it was it was decent, but it meant being away at sea for eight months. Wow! And of, and of course, the problem with being away at sea for eight months is you can't do any other auditions for anything else. Mm. And so there was the allure of okay, well, it's a stable piece of work now that will take up eight months but everything else is on hold you can't audition for anything else you can't do anything else even if you if you got a call back from one of the auditions that you did a few months before you can't now accept that job because you've just accepted this one and you're going to be at sea and there's nobody going to come and pick you up in a helicopter and fly you off out there it's very difficult to break that kind of contract so I, I I think that's quite a nice metaphor, if you like, when we're saying yes to architecture projects that aren't a fit, is that we end up getting taken out to sea and we can't do anything else. And, you know, the if it's not the right thing, then you're saying no to all of those other opportunities that might be available for you. So what you're saying is there's a hidden cost. There's a hidden cost. Yeah, I remember learning back in, what was it, back in high school, in economics class, they taught us this concept of opportunity cost. And Mm -hmm. I mean, even myself as a businessman, even when I look, this is probably something that we don't pay enough attention to. I mean, just people in general. We're always looking at the direct costs of something, but very rarely are we ever evaluating the opportunity costs, right? And this is what can get us this is what can cause us to leave a life, live a life of reaction instead of a life of intention mm-hmm. because we're just going for the things that on the surface appear to be the quickest wins, right? It's interesting that, that we brought up this topic, Ryan, because, well, let's, let's frame up the problem first, right? What is the problem here? So the problem is that, and what we've discovered working with our clients is that many of our clients right now have taken on or they have too much work. They have too much work in their practice. So they're oversubscribed. And some of the unpleasant consequences of being oversubscribed is an elevated stress level for the practice owner because you're worried about deadlines. There can be problems with client expectations like clients being put off or clients having to wait and then you as a practice owner having to worry about having projecting the wrong image like you're slow. Like no one wants to be known as the slow firm. But if you're oversubscribed, oftentimes you might tell them, hey, we can't start on that till two months, three months, four months down the line. It's one of the problems. In addition, you may be trying to stack more on top of your team members. You may be 
underestimating the amount of time it ha actually takes to get a project done, which means that when you're ready to start that new project, you're still caught in the weeds on the projects that you're working on now, which prevents you from then moving on to the new projects, which would allow new revenue to come into the practice, some freshness in terms of you're working on different projects. I mean, we all know what it's like to have that project that just kind of lingers in the office, right? Just like never seems to go away. It's, so it's, very this, it's a very real is. problem. Yeah, I, I, um, I was chatting to one of our clients earlier today and um, they were explaining how they had taken on a number of low commitment consultations or feasibility studies or small little chunk little chunks of work from a number of clients weren't sure if all of them were actually a fit to do the larger project and on the one hand great i'm getting paid for uh, all these proposals essentially you know there's a kind of small light touch piece of work and getting paid for it great but now they've all built up and Another project has been kicking off and has caused problems and now there's this backlog. And what was really interesting was the mental anxiety that all those tiny little projects were causing and were being so internally corrosive and just the guilt, the guilt, the feeling really bad, um, I haven't communicated with these clients, I've taken, I've taken their money and they're waiting on me, and then the invention of stories inside your own mind of what that client must be thinking about me that I haven't been in contact for a few weeks, and they must be waiting, but I haven't heard. And it's this kind of big unknown of like what's really happening and what the actual client is really thinking that leaves this gap for our mind to run riot. And that's, that is very, um, it's very corrosive, and it kind of compounds itself. It compounds anxiety. Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a very unsettled feeling. That's a very unsettled feeling to feel. It's sort of like, um, you know, avoiding a difficult conversation. I know I've been there many times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember one of my first girlfriends, I just knew it wasn't working out. But I was just like, maybe if we just let this drag on long enough, finally, maybe she'll just walk away. <laughs> Didn't want to have to tell her that this isn't going to work out, you know. So there's this element of us wanting to kind of kick the can down the road, um, not have these conversations with our clients or feel bad or guilty that we're not able to attend to their project uh, when we'd like to. And probably even more damaging than anything, Ryan, I would say, perhaps is an erosion of our own personal feeling of integrity. Yeah. So what can happen, the, the biggest consequence here, what can happen is that it actually erodes our own certainty. I was talking with another uh, uh, another person earlier today, and she was saying that she has difficulty selling projects because she lacks the confidence that they can actually complete them on time, right? So now it actually impacts her ability to bring in new work of the kind yeah. of projects they do want to work on because they're caught in a cycle of having too much work. I'm going to paraphrase Glenn Murcutt here. He said something along the lines of the kind of projects you take on today inform the clients that you'll get tomorrow. The kind of products that we take on today inform the products we get tomorrow. Earlier today, I actually did an interview with Mary Johnston. Uh, those of you who are listening to this episode, you can go back and listen to that episode if you haven't. She's a wonderful lady, wonderful. She started up her practice with Ray uh, over 30 years ago in Seattle out of their basement bungalow. And on the podcast episode, she shared a lot of insights about being through recessions. She's been through multiple recessions. She talked about their insights about that. She talked about insights about gaining new work and new project client types that are that are higher caliber. But one of the things that she definitely said was one of her tips for recession is whatever you can do, resist the urge to take on projects that aren't a fit. Mm -hmm. So in other words, resist the urge to say yes to everything. Now it's hard to do. And Ryan, you were talking about earlier how in the smart practice program that we run, one of the common questions that we, we get is like, how do I say no to products that aren't a fit? And you and I, we kind of joked, you're like, oh, how do you say no? <laughs> you ready? You ready for it? You ready? How do you say no, Ryan? How do you say no to a project? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's oversimplified because there's obviously, so there's some psychology here. Mm -hmm. 
All right, there's some psychology at work. Consider that there's something between our ears that's happening that's making it difficult to say no to projects. And I've, I, if I had a dollar for every architectural professional firm owner who came to us and said, oh, I'm just, I can't say no, or I'm accepting too many projects, or I don't know how to say no, uh, we would both be rolling. We, we'd be like Scrooge McDuck taking the baths in the in the <laughs> bathtub full of money, spitting gold coins out of our mouth. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Duck tails. Did they have that over there in the UK? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Duck tails. Woo! <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. like <laughs> Classic 90s cartoon. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, let's talk about what is like, what really cycle, what, let's get a little cycle analytical here. What is happening beneath the surface when we're oversubscribed with work? Because let's face it, if we were all logical robots, we would, we would logically plan out how much work we have, how much resources we have, how many team members we have to get the work done. And if the project doesn't fit into that timeline, we would say we can't do it. Or we'd say, you know what, I, I can do it six months from now and I'm going to save your spot for that. But Firm owners don't do that. First of all, they don't have the visibility to actually see what their project workload is with that kind of fine detail. But even when they know they're oversubscribed, a lot of times you're taking on more projects than you can actually handle. It's very, very common. Not uncommon at all. But what do you what do you think, Ryan? What what have we seen? It's not just supposition, but what's what's underneath this here? What's under what's the So I, there's a there's a couple of things that spring to mind. One is a scarcity mindset and this sounds a bit counterintuitive particularly when you're really busy with loads of work absolutely and, and it's not the right what, what kind is a scarcity work. mindset ryan actually i know some people don't actually know what that is so this is this is a mindset that everything is running out mm. there is resources are scarce this is what the news yeah. tells us if you watch the news the news is based on um, kind of perpetuating a sense of scarcity because it's frightening and when things are frightening we take notice and we pay attention i.e. we grab a newspaper and we carry on reading mm -hmm. right so the scarcity mindset is it's a default human beings for whatever reasons we're much more alert to to pain and avoiding of pain than we are the seeking of pleasure and and mm -hmm. abundance but this the scarcity mindset is very deep it's you know people could inherit it from your community, from parents, from school, um, but it's a kind of ongoing narrative that there isn't enough. There isn't enough, and I've got to fight to get what is what is mine. And it's like the it's also it's kind of connected to greed as well. Right? Really? Tell me about that. Well, it architects aren't greedy. Well, there's there's a there's a greediness that comes with being scarce mm. right and mm. there's there's a there's a kind of like over attachment to things and a, and a kind of holding on to stuff and which kind of perpetuates a sense of of in, of being impoverished and there's a kind of you know there's a there's a greediness around it there's like Absolutely. a more there's, yeah. there's like more there's more attachment to it it's it's it's, it's too limited and there isn't a sense of certainty or you know or, or or a feeling like i deserve to get something or a feeling of it's going to happen for me naturally you know although there isn't a sense of opportunity there isn't the ability to see opportunity there isn't the ability to to reframe um circumstances rapidly and instantaneously it's we see something, we look at it, it automatically means we're running out. So I'll give you an example. I had somebody say to me the other day, um, you know, they were running a, a Facebook advertising campaign and they said, I got 300 impressions and seven click-throughs. Okay. I was like, great. What are you making that mean? that there's no work, nobody's interested right now. Like this country's going to the dogs. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's, it's tough out there. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Okay. Yeah. But all mm -hmm. it was, was, was numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just numbers. Mm -hmm. But then, then there was a story behind all of that, which was, which was inside of scarcity. Mm. So we've, we've probably all dealt with this 
in our lives at some point, you know, if we've ever felt, if we found ourselves getting overly attached to a result and it becomes really meaningful, yeah. perhaps at school or when you're getting your grades, you know, it, when, when we're getting overly attached to the result or the outcome of something, it's because we feel that the result or the outcome is scarce. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've experienced this tons. This is something I've dealt with tons in my life. Uh, one, here's how I like to put it, Ryan. So when I fast, oftentimes when I fast or I've gone without food for a certain amount of time, I'm starving by the time it comes around to eat. Mm-hmm. And so it's like going to a Thanksgiving meal when you're starving. You know, some of us have tried this 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 ploy. You're going to a holiday meal and uh, you know there's going to be tons of food there. And so you're like, well, I want to save my appetite up because I want to take advantage of all that delicious smorgasbord of food that will, mm-hmm. like that word smorgasbord of food that I'll be eating. <laughs> so we go there and we gorge ourselves and we just are, are, we're just stuffing food away in this. And then after that, we feel completely sick. We feel a bit hungover. We don't feel good. We feel gross. It's that idea, right? It's coming from when we're in scarcity, when we're experiencing lack, we go into something. So it's like that with the architectural projects. It's like a hungry kid that's been on the streets, maybe went through a recession or two, knows what that feels like. Now, there's tons of food out there, meaning there's a lot of projects out there. And there's a, this is the crazy part. There's, there's an innate part of us that actually, and this is why our clients ask us, how do we say no? Because what they're actually fighting against is their subconscious. So brain researchers have shown very conclusively that our everyday awareness, five to 10% of our brain or our consciousness is like, or our actions go back to our, our actual native consciousness that we experience. And like 90% of it is complete autopilot, which means That when you're presented with a project, what's going to happen is your subconscious is saying, hell yes, we need that project. I don't want to go through that pain again. And so it triggers all sorts of emotions in our body that cause us to want to accept that project, Mm -hmm. right? That cause us want to move ahead in the, in the face of our emotions. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of take, it's saying yes to something because there's an underlying hidden fear that's calling the shots. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So, so this is this is interesting, and, and and you know, saying as well that scarcity and this relationship with greed, you know, being in scarcity, and then when there is a feast at hand, then we have the propensity to be greedy, right? And then we end up saying yes to stuff that we shouldn't be saying yes to. And everyone has been down that road. And we've all done that. I and mean, you've been we've down that road. road. You've been down that road. The, then you're busy, the, like you said. Then then you can't you can't you can't do the other auditions for the other shows. Now this is this is strategic here. So this is this is big picture strategy because the thing with strategy is it makes itself apparent over time. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you, Ryan, when we say it makes it apparent over time? How do you mean? Yeah, exactly. I thought our, our, our <laughs> listeners might be thinking the same thing. Well, some decisions we can make right away. Like if I get a, a project in the door, I can accept it. Great. And I have, I have money right now. Like you talked about Yvonne's uh, cruise position mm-hmm. acting, right? So yeah, it seemed like a great decision from the short-term view. It's like, great. It's a high-paying job. I'm going to be employed for six months. It's a, it's a great project. It's going to bring in money. When I say it's a great project, I mean it's going to fill the coffers. It's going to keep mm-hmm. us busy. But in a longer term, when we compound those kind of decisions year after year after year, there's a very real long-term effect of that, which is what you talked about at the beginning of the podcast with your wonderful metaphor slash example. Yeah. Is that we're blind. We're not seeing what we're giving up. And yeah. so this is one of the – this. if I had to pick one of the consistent themes that we've seen out of all the podcast interviews that I've done as we've talked to every single successful practice owner that we've had here on the podcast, as we've looked at all the clients that we've worked with, pushing you know over 300 small architectural practices now and more. This is like, this is going to be right up the top as one of the levers of success, which is the kind of projects you take on. But not only that, but being able to say no to projects that aren't headed in, that they won't add to your vision. Like this is very, very difficult to do. But the mm-hmm. practices that do it are the ones that over time have that trend line where they're able to get 
phenomenally better projects. They're able to start to build their brand equity. They're start to able to get a name for themselves in this particular project type. They're able to have breakthrough projects, but only because, see, this is the part we don't see because we don't see behind the curtains. We don't see that they had to say no to some projects to be able to say yes to those projects. And that is very, very difficult to do. Yep. Now, for those of you who have attended our 60 minute for motor masterclass that you can get access to by going to smartpracticemethod.com. One of the keys that we talk about in that presentation is the idea of right clients. So when we look at the levers of running a successful architectural practice, like Ryan and I, as we've talked to different practice owners and we look at the success of different practices, having the, the kind of clients you have really, really matter. They're going to have a huge impact on whether your work schedule is completely insane, whether you're stressed out all the time, whether you're not making barely any money, uh, whether you lack the refunds, the, the sources, the, the, the resources to hire exceptional employees. Like a lot of that goes right back to the kind of clients that you're accepting that you're working with. So the title today is how to know, how do we know if projects are a fit for us? Well, one of the other things I'd add to this as well is on a practical level that scarcity often emerges from like a lack of skill okay and often mm. we don't like to take responsibility for not knowing how to do something or you know I see it quite often in architecture firms people like to believe that nobody knows how to run an architecture firm it's a mystery. Nobody knows how to do it. Some people just have it. Some people don't have it. It's a tough industry. It's really difficult. And we know we've seen and had the privilege to be able to speak to many, many successful architecture um, practice owners and and have studied what they do. And we've spoken to lots of hundreds of consultants who have helped some of the most successful firms in the world. And we've helped lots of firms that there are well tried and tested principles and strategies for winning work and for making an architecture business work, making any business work. Okay, there are principles. They need to be adapted and it's by no means, you know, super simple always, but there are principles and tried and tested strategies that, that work. So there's a kind of belief, if you like, that, you know, it's a mystery. Nobody knows how to do it. And then there's a doubt of my own selling skills okay mm. so people don't often take responsibility for you know what i don't know how to i don't know how to sell you think you think that they actually have that conversation in their head right i think so the if you're if you're saying i don't know how to sell then i think yeah. that's a step forward because then you can do something with that thought like go and Absolutely. learn how to sell but normally it masks that kind of the reality masquerades itself as the belief nobody knows how to run an architecture business it's really hard out there it's impossible and so people have that because they don't know that there is a skill of selling or marketing or don't believe in it as a as a as a thing you know it's just sort of yeah. hocus pocus for some people then of course if you believe that then of course you're going to be in scarcity because you've got no that's ability, right, that's right. You, you've got no ability to take responsibility for the results that you're getting. I love that. So it, so it becomes you're at the impact of the circumstances. Therefore, it's the economy, it's the recession, it's out there, it's the industry being too hard, it's too competitive. Yeah, well, and, let me give an example on that, Ryan. So, uh, growing up, I was never very good at a popular American sport called basketball. And uh, if you grew up in the Nick. U.S., it's I know with my height, I'm tall, but nope, nope. You know, it's it's sort of like it's sort of like soccer or football is in in other countries, right? It's it's the game that kids play to socially to get along, just to hang yeah. out, shoot the basketball around. Where I'm at, anyways, uh, and I was never very good at it. I remember uh, it was I was tried out for the first time when I was like nine years old, and I remember very specifically I had just gotten out of our our Boy Scout troop, and I was still wearing. 
it was the Cub Scout on my Boy Scout uniform. It's probably Cub Scouts because I was that age. And I remember that it was like, it was a, it was a Cub Scout ceremony. So I had these nice fancy dress shoes on, you know, the, the leather ones that you kind of polish and they have the hard black soles on the bottom. And, um, at the time I didn't have any good tennis shoes. And so my mom took me to this basketball trout. First time I'd ever tried basketball. I mean, I've, I've kind of bounced the ball around here and there just around recess, but I'd never actually like been on a team or anything. So my mom takes me there. Uh, it's at the rec center. We show up. I'm still wearing my Boy Scout shirt. I'm wearing these like these dress shoes. <laughs> and then we're like, there, we're supposed to hop in there with all the other kids and we're supposed to do some drills. So we're supposed to dribble the, the basketball. We're supposed to do some layups and some baskets and things like that. And I, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. It's extremely uncomfortable, very embarrassing. <laughs> And then at the end, so at the end, they take us into the back room where the coaches are then picking out the team members. And, and as, as, the, as, the, as the team members are being picked, slowly the line against the wall is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's like only me and a couple kids left. And by this time, I'm feeling like in the gutter. I'm feeling like I'm horrible. No one likes me. I'm terrible. This is embarrassing. It's the worst thing ever. And then one of the coaches, she looks at me and she says, I'll take him. And then I hear her son who's on the team, you know, he's like, well, the coach's son, he's like this really good basketball player. He says, he says this really loud. So like everyone can hear it. No, mom, don't pick him. He's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I was so embarrassed. And I cried. I cried, Ryan. I cried. I just, I just, I just couldn't hold it back. I was like so embarrassed. I'm like, oh, I hate this. So... <laughs> That obviously that has stuck in my heart. I still have, I still have a bit of anxiety around basketball, but here's the thing. I don't like playing basketball. So whenever people invite us to go play basketball or like in our church group, sometimes there's like basketball leagues and we have the opportunity to go play basketball. Do I play? No, I don't. And the reason why I say I don't like it is because I say it's not fun. Mm -hmm. I don't like playing basketball because it's not fun. Right. But why is it not fun? The reason why it's not fun is because I'm terrible at it. No one likes to get out on the basketball court and be terrible at something, mm -hmm. right? And so this is very similar to, I love what you talked about when we take it back to scarcity, right? That oftentimes we're in scarcity because we lack a skill, but we're blind to that. So a lot of times when we look at the root cause of accepting so many projects, of being in the feast or famine cycle, um, ultimately what it comes down to is our own lack of confidence in being able to make it rain. In other words, our own lack of confidence of being able to bring in work on demand. Because if you're a rainmaker, if you're someone who knows how to go out there and get the work, I guarantee you're going to be confident in a good economy, in a bad economy. You'll probably be even more confident in bad economy because you know that everyone who's unskilled is going to be running for the hills Freaking and you're going to be doubling yeah. down. Yeah. And you're going to yeah. be more confident. And that's when you're going to win. Right. So the antidote, the true antidote for saying no, uh, not worrying about recessions, feeling more confident as a firm owner, like not being scared of recessions, but actually being excited when the market starts to change and being able to pick the right kind of projects. One of the best things you can do as a practice owner is to develop what we might call samurai skills in the ability to make it rain for your practice. And this is something that they don't teach you in school. Uh, there's not many mentors know, even know how to do this. It's not something that's commonly taught, right? Now we teach it as part of the smart practice method because of that reason, because it's one of the principal pillars of doing away with that scarcity. So the scarcity, in fact, is actually just a mask for, like you said, the lack of something that we lack within ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's why we're scarce. So if we flip that around and we say, okay, how could I be confident in an abundance instead of scarcity? If I have skills, if I'm confident in my ability to bring in projects, to make connections, to know what to say, to know how to present our services so that clients see them as valuable, to know how to charge premium fees, even when everyone else is fighting based upon fee alone. Like these are all skills that can be taught and they can be learned. But step number one is what we call going from asleep to aware, like asleep to aware. So asleep is like, I don't even think there are some skills I'm missing. I just think that this is just how the market works. And I'm a victim to all of this. And man, it sure is tough, but I'm going to stick it in because this is what I love. That's like the asleep phase. Aware phase is when we say, okay, wow, I realize there is a skill I'm missing here. Oh, 
these guys, Enoch and Ryan, man, maybe they, maybe they have some, maybe they know a thing or two. Like if I was truly confident in my ability to be able to generate work on demand from good clients and pursue awesome work, then I wouldn't feel so pressured to say yes to all these other projects. And then step number three is to be activated. And then step number four is to be completely awake, meaning that now you're at that place where you have that skill and you're in abundance instead of scarcity. Yeah. So there's a couple of things we look at to determine if clients are a fit. So number one, uh, if they're, if it's repeat work, that's always going to be like top on the list. Do your, are the clients that are approaching you, is there ability to do repeat work with them? Like that's the holy grail. If you can find clients that pay good fees and they have a steady stream of work, you may never have to do business development ever again. Okay, so that's number one. Number two would be the mission of the company. So aligning with the actual purpose of the organization that you're serving. If it's a, you know, if it's um, if it's a slave trafficking ring, they want a new headquarters, you may not want to be involved. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a bit of an extreme, but we know we do have this in architecture with like firms that do jails and firms that do prisons. I, right? I remember once talking to an architecture practice who the majority of the team were all vegan or vegetarian okay. and they took on a project for some kind of meat packing facility. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? No way. <laughs> Times must have been really tough. We were in the depths of the decession, recession. We took on a, a hog slaughtering plan. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so there's alignment um another thing would be the the recognition of value of architecture so actually valuing the architectural services understanding the value of design so clients that actually acknowledge that uh another criteria would be uh the pockets having having a big budget having large budget let's face it you know he who has the gold makes the rules in other words uh clients when they have plenty of money to spend on their projects when they're not constrained by super tight budgets, it's going to make your job a lot easier. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so kind of evaluating the overall construction value of the project, your ability mm -hmm. to command decent fees from it, yep. um, the lifespan of the project inside of the office. So it's all very well and good having a project which has got fantastic, fantastically high fees, but if it's going to be spread over 150 years then maybe that's not as big a fit as you thought it was okay Speaking well, of that, Ryan, i knew an, i knew an architect once he was working on a project for and maybe some of our listeners have done this 20 years yeah and it wasn't a skyscraper actually this was for a famous a famous uh, musician and it was one of those things where they're just perennially adding on to their home and so literally he had one client and he'd been working with him for 20 years years on the same project now i want to know what musician it was was it Prince? yeah or okay. it's, it's under wraps it's confidential <laughs> oh. Don't tell anyone. yeah yeah well i mean i mean that's that again that's that's interesting you've got projects you know large infrastructure projects like terminal five in the uk that was a 25 year project or maybe 30 yeah. year project from inception to actually the first plane taking off yeah. or I've been involved with, with buildings that have had 18, 20 year lifespans inside of a big office. Um, and sometimes these projects go through three or four feasibility changes. Sometimes they go through a change of owner. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting to this is like, now the market we serve, so we're serving small architectural practices, right? That's who we work with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a small architectural practice, unlikely that, that you're probably going to land a a terminal five project or a, a 25 year project. If you do mm -hmm. more power to you, but what you're probably up against is you're probably up against looking at taking on a lot of small projects. So having to take on a, a large quantity of projects. And so there is, there's definitely something to say for like, okay, are we going to take on a lot of these small projects or can we actually start to move to a bigger project type? What we see more often than not, Ryan, is that practice owners, they're always looking how to, optimize what they're currently doing as opposed to making a pivot or a transformation that has a big win. Mm -hmm. Right? So 
unfortunately, one of the difficulties of getting different results in business or running an architectural practice is we only have our past experience to base our future decisions on. And so this is something that we see keep so many practice owners caught at a certain plateau and they don't understand why. Well, it's simply because what they're trying to do is they're trying to improve just incrementally what they did yesterday by maybe charging a little bit higher fees, by maybe you know small incremental improvements in optimization. Whereas if they were able to make a complete pivot and start to go after a new project type, things would change overnight practically. However, the problem with that, it goes back to the business development skills that architects lack that we're never trained in. So we actually don't even entertain that as a possibility because we don't see that as possible because they're like, well, how am I supposed to go out and get these products? I don't have a portfolio in that. Or these other firms have a long time doing this or X, Y, or Z or 10,000 reasons. And so we stay stuck with the same products that we do again and again and again and again and again. So we've identified the problem. The problem is accepting too many projects that don't fit. Ultimately, the solution here is to get out of resignation, to take personal responsibility, to just to take inventory of, okay, what skills am I lacking? How can I gain those skills? And how can I make a pivot that would be a transformational moment, a transformational move, instead of just a slight improvement or an optimization? There is, there's also... You know, you, we can get in inside of developing a vision framework and perhaps like a five-year summit plan, summit map that we'll do with our clients, for example, becomes another set of tools to help become empowered in saying no to projects. So like you were saying, you know, one of the criteria to consider whether a project is a fit or not is whether it's aligned with your vision. So that would suggest that you need to get a vi- you need to get a vision and a mission in place in your business if you don't have that already so actually starting to create and declare a new future for where the business is going what you are standing for what it is that you want to contribute um what do you want to create both personally for your own lifestyle and for your own wealth and for your own um, career and what do you want to contribute in terms of your craft and and an architecture and perhaps there's missions around sustainability that lots of our clients have nowadays and um lots of lots of our clients have got uh, missions around certain communities and parts of parts of their geographic locations that are important to them um so developing a strong mission and articulating it you know coming up with your values and a purpose and and a clear maybe a 10 or 25 year goal that's big and audacious and makes you a little bit scared, but it's, you know, it's, there's a rallying cry that can be created around it and it's compelling for you and it's empowering. Okay. That's, that's important to start having that because that will become a tool to help you say no to these other, other projects. It also becomes a great motivator in terms of, um, being able to, um, you know, to, to develop new skills, because if you set a big audacious goal, um, one of the first things that you do when you start planning around how that might be possible is you start to identify where are some of your existing weaknesses or where might there be skill gaps. So it's a bit of a, it's a kind of you're starting to reframe things in a very, in a, in a very different manner, if you like. And the other, the other thing to consider is that when we're, when we're working towards a vision, we can start to become quite strategic and we can plan to start saying no to certain types of projects on a certain date. So, for example, we'll, um, we'll work with our clients and we'll have them arrange all of their projects into different tiers. Okay, and so let's imagine that you've got the dream projects, you call them tier A, and the projects that perhaps are less less desirable for you are called tier E. Okay, and then there's everything in between. And some clients will say the tier E's and the tier D's are driving me crazy. They're small, tiny, fiddly, super unprofitable. I don't want to do them anymore. Okay, but right now, that's all I've got, and they're keeping the lights on. Okay, so we want to get to a tier A. The tier A becomes clearly defined in terms of 
the type of client, the type of problems that the client is experiencing, who might be access or a gateway to those sorts of projects. And we can start to create a clear picture and a roadmap to, towards getting that kind of client. Then we can make uh, an intelligent estimate of how long we think it might take before we can get those sorts of those projects. And then we can start to make a plan and say, okay, then I'm going to give myself six months and within six months' time, I'm going to have closed on one of these tier A projects or perhaps a handful of tier Bs and tier Cs. And at six months' time, I'll be in a position and I will say no more tier E projects. Great. And then I know that a tier, a, a tier E project lasts no longer than six months. So I can see for the end of the year, we will be tier E free. Okay. So that, that works out a kind of a bit of a, a bit of a structure to saying no and to mentally get prepared and for executing and for fo and for following on your your plan other businesses we've seen you know they might have say some c and d projects they don't really like the c and d projects but they're really profitable and they're they're doing quite well and it's like okay but we want to be doing the tier a projects well we've seen businesses who have created two identities and they've created a, a separate identity that does the C, the C and D projects. And it's a different kind of branding. It's a different personality. And actually, they've got their process and their workflow really well refined. And it's a good cash cow. And actually, there's a lot of enjoyment just in getting that kind of work done well and correctly. And also, the people that work on those projects understand that it's a different service and a different level of delivery that's being given to the tier A's and the tier B's, for example, which might be your super high end luxury residential houses. And again, a more, a more sophisticated company would have a completely different branding and marketing or at least a, a kind of language funnel, at least to attract those kinds of clients. And some of the clients wouldn't, the, the two different types of clients may never know that the same business does both of them, but under a different a different name so there's there's tools there again you know the power of developing a mission and a vision and then getting strategic around it and you know it can be as simple as just drafting out a timeline for for five years and starting to create you know five years time I want to be a five million dollar practice and you know how do I want that five million dollars or how could that five million dollars be made up all right well it could be four tier a projects 10 tier B projects and two tier C projects. Okay, so you can start doing the math behind it. And and actually that that in itself brings up a lot of abundance because you start looking at that figure, 5 million, and there's probably about 30, 40, 100 different ways that you could generate of different mixes of project typologies that would make up that revenue. So already when you start doing the maths behind it, well, just kind of like the it's very simple arithmetic around how could it be broken up it starts to give you a sense of like wow there's loads of different ways that that target could be reached then you can start asking some more detailed questions over which would be the most appropriate for me where do my existing assets and skills lie what are certain routes to um you know finding and pinpointing and closing one of those tier a projects who do i know who's doing these tier a projects already that we could we could partner with and and leverage and a whole world of possibilities starts to emerge which is moving out of scarcity and you know you're getting a sense of you're getting a sense of abundance yeah and you're not uh, i love that you brought up the vision because you're not your mind doesn't know what to focus on if you don't have at least have a vision. So mm -hmm. there's a part of the brain called the reticular activating system. The human brain, basically one of the things that the thinking part of our brain does is it helps us survive from day to day by just focusing in on one single thing at a time, right? Just focusing on one single thing at a time. And in addition to that, what the reticular activating system does is it basically it's a record, it's a pattern recognition system that helps us recognize patterns in the environment outside of us. Now, what does this have to do with architectural projects? Well, let me give you a quick example uh, that's not related to architecture. When people, when you're driving along the road, well, what often happens when people are out driving and they had an accident is their eyes, 
lead their car. In other words, their car goes wherever their eyes go. And oftentimes, you'll find people that get in accidents on country roads in the middle of nowhere, and they've run into the only telephone pole within miles <laughs> or a tree. And you're wondering, how did this happen? Well, it's because as they're getting into a spin out or whatever's happening, their eyes are focused on where they don't want to go. Their eyes are focused on avoiding that tree. So unavoidably, what do they do? They hit the tree. This happens when I mountain bike as well. So I remember a lot of times when I mountain bike, as I'm going down some of these steeper trails, there's usually sometimes there's a rut in the very middle where the erosion has caused this little miniature canyon uh, where it's pretty deep. And so what happens is a lot of times what used to happen is I would, I would focus on that. I would get scared about it. And then boom, my tire would fall right into that little crack. And then when your tire falls in that crack, you're a goner because you have no mobility. You're going to flip the handlebars or something that's terrible, right? So in other words, however, when I'm riding my mountain bike and I'm looking ahead down the trail and I'm focused on where I want to go, then I let the short term take care of itself. It's like the short term almost takes care of itself. If I'm looking 10 yards, let's say five yards ahead, mm. I'm looking a good 10 to 15 feet, probably 15 feet ahead of me, right? If I'm looking three yards ahead of me and I'm able to do that and just keep my focus up there, then subconsciously I'm taking in the internal terrain and I'm just going over the train that's right in front of me. This is very similar to what Ryan's talking about here, which is the power of a vision. When we have a vision, a clear vision of what we want, where we want to head to, like this is crystal clear in our mind. This is why people talk about vision boards and all that stuff is because then we can sort of put the day to day on autopilot. It's much less stressful because then we're just navigating the small bumps in the road while we have our mind, a reticular activating system that is open to opportunities and looking for patterns is focused on the future. So what ends up happening is when opportunities come across our lap or in front of us, our ears perk up, our eyes perk up and we say, ah, this opportunity fits in with the vision I have. Let's go for it. But if we don't have that vision set, then that same opportunity can come along. We don't even notice it. It's like we're asleep and that opportunity mm -hmm. just floats on by and we don't take advantage of it. And we kept on doing more of the same. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's also really Im important here, you know, that there are people who have um, like hunger and drive, right? And uh, we'll see this all the time. The, the people who are just, you know, you know that they're going places and they've just got this hunger and they're going to figure it out and they've got a clear vision in mind. And sometimes it's not always a clearly articulated vision, but it's a, it's like, it's a clear sense of direction. And it's a clear, and it's, there's also emotion wrapped up into it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And, and so when we're kind of creating a vision for our business it's important to 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 infuse it with like feeling and emotion mm -hmm. and what's the experience going to be like and like a kind of greater sense of who are you going to become by by pursuing this path or vision or you have a vision for yourself Okay, so this is the other this is the other kind of vision. Like some people have a very strong vision of who they are and of them being, um, you know, an achiever, or they they get a lot of satisfaction just out of doing better. So they have a vision of themselves doing the impossible or doing difficult things, and you know that becomes a real, you know, the the vision of themselves becomes something that can drive them them forward and to transform scarcity mindset into abundance mindset so and, and again that this is this is on the other side of it of, of being you know we can get very analytical and intellectual about it and visualize numbers and like the different types of projects like i was describing earlier and that's very useful because there's like an intellectual exercise that surrounds that and then there's the sort of the feeling the emotion about it perhaps it helps to to have a clear mental image of what your life would be like, the experiences, to focus on the things that you love doing and you'll be able to do more of them. Or perhaps it's the experience of just, you know, and the enjoyment of designing incredible buildings or, you know, or you know that your work needs to be seen and brought to life and you're mm. listening to that vision and drive and you know that, you know, you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see people who are not particularly great salespeople um but the hunger and the kind of you know unwavering self-belief that my work must it be experienced and i'm going to do whatever i need to figure out how to how to do it 
um, you know, those those guys become very successful. It's like yeah. you know, often yeah. hear stories of Zaha Hadid, who I don't think she had any formal sales training, but she she figured she was, it out. Hunger goes a long way. She figured it out. She 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 was she knew she knew that she had to get her work seen by the right people. She knew that there were stories of her. Um, you know, when she'd go to a party, she'd make sure she was invited to the right party and then she'd figure out who all the wealthy people were in the room and she wanted to go and make sure she had a conversation with them and make sure she goes and speaks with them and would say something, you know, like, you need to see my work, you need to, we need to have a conversation. Okay, so there's this kind of assertiveness that comes from, you know, from just this, the, a deep sense of, of self-belief. Yeah, well, and, <laughs> it's, know, a whole that, nother, it, it's a whole nother episode, right? Because so many of us were told as kids, like, you're doing it wrong. You're not getting the right answers. And uh, we've had so many people growing up tell us that we can't do it, that that we're not enough. Uh, it is rare to find someone who's naturally has that chutzpah, so to speak, where they just know they're going to go out there and they're <laughs> going to get it. They're going to make it happen. <laughs> chutzpah. You like that? What does that mean even? I Look like, that up on Google. Did I even use that correctly? I, I, I like that. I, like I think that. that's like, um, what is that? Is that Yiddish or something? All the good words come from Yiddish. You know that, right? Chapspa. Do you know what Yiddish is, Ryan? The, is it Hebrew or like Jewish yeah, language? I, I th yeah, I think it's a colloquial. It's like it developed out of Hebrew, but it's like from the diaspora, the Jews who were in like Germany or some of the European countries. Um, and those of you who know Yiddish, you can correct us and tell me I'm completely wrong. Chutzpah. chutzpah. Let's see. What does chutzpah mean? Chutzpah from the Hebrew word chutzpah, and it means audacity. Extreme self-confidence or audacity. I love that. Chutzpah. Yeah. That's a great word. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. It's exactly what we're talking about. And it actually says it is, it is Yiddish. It's a Yiddish word meaning impudence or gall. Oh, that's a little bit different. Some different, uh, different, different definitions here. All right. So, Ryan, there you have it. We've discussed a big, big topic today and uh, basically the idea that every architecture project isn't a fit. Every architecture project isn't a fit. And the start sooner you can no. start saying no, the sooner you can start accepting projects that are a fit, then the sooner you're going to progress towards your vision. But that begs the question, uh, do you have a vision? And if you don't, well, we know what to do next. We invite you to head on over to smartpracticemethod.com. Uh, watch our free 60-minute firm owner masterclass on how to structure your practice so you can do the best work more often. And we look forward to seeing you on the other side. And that's a wrap. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture the views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.